Welcome everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Penn State College of Medicine COVID-19 Echo Series. We're delighted to have you join us for another session. It's our second session today. My name is Jackie Sable and I'm a member of the Echo team and I'll be facilitating today's discussion. A few announcements before we begin. If you haven't already done so, please put your name and email address and affiliation in the chat box. Please stay muted unless you're speaking. You may also use the chat for communicating, but if you, if you do want to unmute throughout the session, please feel free to do so. Um, please remember that there is no personally identifiable information allowed when we're discussing cases. We are recording these sessions, and in the spirit of all teach, all learn, we'll be on a first name basis throughout the session. Our echo sessions always begin with a brief lecture followed by a case discussion. The cases include a question or a challenge that you might want to address, and they're a critical component of the ECHO model. We encourage you to submit cases which can be related to patients, preparedness, policy, whatever challenge where you would like to generate discussion and ideas from the group. For today's session, we have Dr. Amy DeWaters. She will discuss guidance for hospitalist sections and divisions to prepare for the COVID-19 pandemic. And then we have discussions around case, um, case questions that were submitted by Rebecca Detweiler. Thank you, Rebecca. I don't know if you're logged on yet, but we really appreciate that you've submitted a few questions. Um, during the lecture, please feel free again to put any questions in the chat. We have a team of specialists from Penn State Online. They're going to help field questions. We'll all be, the ECHO team will be monitoring the chat for any questions. Um, but please remember, this is an all teach, all learn, so everyone can share both questions and answers. Feel free to contribute as you're able. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Amy for our brief lecture. All right, happy to see everybody today. I'm Amy DeWaters. I'm one of the hospitalists here at Penn State Health, and with me is our division chief. Fahad Khalid. So what we're gonna be talking about is guidance for hospitalist sections and divisions as you all start to prepare for the COVID-19 pandemic. And we've been very fortunate here at Penn State in that we've had quite a bit of extra time to prepare. We didn't get our first confirmed positive case until Friday evening. And um, we only have our second case at this time. So we recognize that we are in the fortunate situation of having additional time to prepare. So, I wanna talk through a couple of these sections that have been really critical for us as we've gotten ready. The first, no surprise here, is communication, communication, communication. So there's a number of different levels that you all are gonna to need to think about when you start to think about communication strategies for your hospitalist group. First, you need to be communicating with other departments and your own leadership. So Fahad and I decided we were going to do that with daily calls with the chair from the emergency room, a daily call with a member from the infectious disease team, daily huddles with our Department of Medicine chair, and daily calls with our ICU. And we found it's been really critical to have interdepartmental communication on a daily basis because the speed with which all of these protocols and all of the understanding about COVID-19 is changing really requires you to be in constant communication. But you're not just communicating to other departments and to your own leadership, you also have to communicate with your group. So we decided to set up daily morning bulls at 8 a.m. with our entire hospitalist division. We have about 40 hospitalists and we spend that time reviewing new clinical information about COVID, new treatments, any new algorithms that have gone into place to help guide how we admit patients or where we admit them to, what sort of isolation they're on. We review all of those sorts of highly pragmatic clinical information items. Um, we also do nightly email updates to the group one of the things that we thought was really important was to facil facilitate communication with designated phones and pagers. So we got a designated pager for our team that is just for the team that has COVID patients on it. And of course, it's easiest to share information with your group by creating a shared folder that everyone can access. 
and designating someone to make connections elsewhere has been really helpful. Um, Fahad and I have both found that reading information from University of Washington in New York City can really change how you decide to manage. And so we have one member of our group who's very facile on Twitter and Facebook, and we assigned him to be our contact out there on social media, trying to gain information. So we've been really thankful. That was Brian McGillan. We've been really thankful to him for being able to do that and gather information from other places to help further our own protocols and our own education. I'm gonna let Fahad talk about some of our surge and census plans because as we've seen at University of Washington and in New York City, there can be a major surge in census for the hospitalist groups. So you wanna talk about what we did? Sure, so our challenge um, was when we started thinking about this problem that we did not have an inpatient uh, test that was available. The earliest test that we had available was Department of Health, and there were restrictions uh, on that. Uh, but, you know, it, it took 24 to 48 hours for us to get it uh, back. Also, uh, you know, we had to separate our learners uh, away from our teams where they could potentially be exposed to COVID-19 patients. So um, these are our medical students, our residents, and our fellows. So we um, thought about it and what we created was uh, something called a turf team. These were the undifferentiated respiratory failure teams. And so there were two purposes of this team. One, to streamline the process of bringing these patients into the hospital. And two, to try to minimize the exposure to our colleagues. So early on, we anticipated that the numbers were going to be high and staff were going to be exposed. So instead of exposing our whole hospital division and quarantining it, it we tried to limit it to one person. So our turf team, as we call it, uh, is patients that we don't have, are coming in with respiratory symptoms, cough and shortness of breath, and we cannot explain it. So, you know, a chest x-ray, uh, you know, is negative, procalcitonin level is negative. We have a streamlined process of one person that goes down and admits these patients and take care of these patients. When we bring these patients in, we touch base with our disease docs as well to uh, make sure um, that COVID testing does not need to be sent. If a COVID test needs to be sent, we are also the ones that initiate a, a highly infective agent huddle, which is where we send our patients, cohorted patients that have COVID. So, so we started this about uh, over a week ago at this mm -hmm. point, and it has worked really well. So two purposes. One, I think from a staffing perspective, it helps us uh, you know, uh, protect our colleagues. And two, I think it also assures people that there is a plan in place to take care of these patients. So absolutely, we had to risk stratify our colleagues. So we asked for volunteers to staff this team. And then we risk stratify based on medical conditions and age. So I think, you know, when you are thinking about setting up a uh, staffing plan, I think it's important uh, to ask for volunteers and then to risk stratify out people that might, um, you know, not do so well. So uh, our risk stratification is if you have an underlying uh, immunocompromised state, if you are pregnant, or if you are above 60. Again, we can't force people not to take care of these patients, right? But we have a conversation with them about it. So we also uh, did did not know as to how many people we were going to be expecting or anticipating. So we set up, you know, we best case scenario, right, one COVID team, but we have staffing to be able to go up to eight COVID teams, which is basically up to 96 uh, patients that we can take care of, which are going to be floor or, or IMC. We also partnered with our ICU staff to for that and help them create a turf and a COVID team as well. So, and then, um, you know, we're trying to get people rest, you know, while they're working as well. So we're trying to get them a week off in the next four weeks. So, and then you have to think about when you're thinking about staffing, daytime staffing and nighttime staffing, because for us, a lot of admissions come in in the overnight periods. So. Yeah, I think that 
We have a really fabulous ED who's been doing an incredible job of trying to screen people even outside before they even get into the ED. They've set up a tent, they're screening people outside. But for us, what we had to deal with was the reality that none of us are perfect and someone's gonna get through the screening process. And if someone gets through the screening process, how many of your hospitalists are gonna get exposed to that person before you realize they're COVID-19 positive? And you don't want to lose a third of your hospitalist staff to exposure in a time where you could be needing to triple your census. So the idea of creating one designated group of hospitalists that will be going down to see any undifferentiated respiratory failure has actually already saved us mm -hmm. exposure in multiple cases. So we also wanted to think about infection prevention strategies. So as a, yeah, Fahad has to step out because he's on our, uh, different our turf team right now. So infection prevention strategies included, we restricted travel in our group very early, about three weeks ago. We restricted any attendance to national conferences or domestic travel, asking members of the group to avoid crowds. We suspended in-person meetings and are doing everything via Zoom. We ensured our members could get their scrubs on site so that they don't have to wear the same clothes home. Um, that's really important for infection control. We contacted our own infection control here at the institution and we have sani wipes here that easily kill coronavirus. We have partnered with our housekeeping colleagues to make sure that we can be disinfected. We can have all of our work areas disinfected with those wipes three times a day. And then we have provided them in our work areas so that staff can disinfect their pagers and phones and laptops multiple times a day. Obviously, everyone needs proper training on donning and doffing of PPE. And then one of the most critical things that we've done is trying to spread out our workforce. Like a lot of hospitalist groups, we're all kind of condensed in one little circle, um, circular room, and we're all sitting very close to each other. So. Because a lot of our administrative staff have been asked to work from home, we got permission to be able to have our hospitalists use some of their offices so that we would not have to all sit together in the same room and we could really distance from each other. We also wanted to think about different ways that technology could be able to help us. So one of the things that we were able to do, and we we're very excited because we just got them today, um, we were able to purchase virtual stethoscopes. Virtual stethoscopes are capable of listening to hearts and lungs and wirelessly transmitting the sound to your iPhone via an app and uh, allow you to listen to hearts and lungs from outside a room. So what we're going to be doing is we're gonna be using phones to call into patient rooms, taking a history, looking at the patient through windows. Most of our rooms thankfully have windows and then using a virtual stethoscope to listen and do the physical exam from outside the room. So this is not only gonna keep our staff more distance from the patient and hopefully less exposed, but it's also gonna save much needed PPE because we're all in a PPE shortage. We've also been able to set up admission order sets through our EMR. One of the members of our division is part of IT and was able to get us all admission order sets, which really streamlines and standardizes how all of us are treating these patients. You really want to think about resource assessment and reduction strategies as well. So someone in your group needs to understand what the plan is from a surge standpoint and from a geographic cohort standpoint. You need to have an understanding of which rooms are negative pressure and which ones aren't and how your facility plans to cohort. We plan plan to cohort in our surgical ICU most likely. Every facility is going to be different, but you wanna have a key understanding as the hospitalist group of when that's gonna happen and how it's gonna happen. We've also um, been partnering with infectious disease to understand how to reuse our N95s and our face shields. Here at our facility, we're reusing our N95s up to six times by placing a face shield over the N95, you can do that. And then you place the N95 in a paper bag in between uses. We suspended contact precautions for patients who just have a history of MRSA 
and we suspended any more than one provider entering a room for people who are in contact outside of the COVID patients. All of that just to save PPE. And then you want to get creative about finding PPE. We have members of our group who have reached out to pretty much every industry. We reached out to a food production line because they frequently use masks. We reached out to general contractors and we've been pretty successful in finding PPE in other places. One of the things you wanna think about as a hospitalist group is it's not uncommon for half of your workforce to be off for seven days. And you really wanna utilize those people who are off for seven days because they wanna help they want to contribute to the group even if they're not clinically seeing patients. So we mentioned assigning someone to get on social media and get in contact with other divisions. We mentioned having someone help plan your, your surge and census. And we mentioned having someone reach out and try to find creative solutions for PPE. We've also had a group of four or five of our hospitalists come together to build the clinical guidelines for our group. And that's been phenomenally successful. They were the first ones to get us information about using um, remdesivir for treatment, the first ones to get us information about testing and the appropriate testing methods and isolation. So they've really been very effective for us. And then in terms of building your clinical guidelines, you are gonna have to work closely with the ICU and your medical ethics team as you come up with who and what category of patient is gonna get what level of treatment. As we all know, maintaining flow through the hospital is gonna be critical because you're gonna see capacity surge. And when capacity surges, you've gotta be able to get people admitted and discharged. So we were able to coordinate with the ED and the institution to have all admissions and transfers come through the hospitalist service. So even if it's a patient who's usually surgical, but they're positive and they have COVID-19, they are gonna to come to medicine and they are going to have surgery as a consultant. This is to streamline admission from the ED and to help the patients. Uh, those of you who have more experience with these patients, I'm sure have seen this. I've seen it now twice. The speed of respiratory decompensation is astonishing. And I think having hospitalists as the primary who can recognize that respiratory decompensation is really essential. We're also working on standardizing our discharge instructions and coordinating with our post-acute care colleagues to make sure that when it is time for discharge, we're able to discharge people without incident. And then you gotta support the wellness of your group. So everyone's going through a lot of stress. We've created groups of three providers to check in on each other daily. So even though we're spreading people out and we're um, getting separate workspaces, we can all see each other and coordinate and check on each other and make sure we're okay. We uh, got a stack of Reese's Pieces and Hershey bars because we're in Hershey, Pennsylvania. So we had to get a stack of Hershey bars in the office for people. And we asked, We've had a wonderful group um, with the division of GIM and in hospital medicine working on coordinating childcare options. So you wanna to try to keep people's spirits up. And then even though this is an incredibly, incredibly serious situation, obviously, we try to add a little levity to our 8 a.m. morning meetings and you all need to do what works for your group. My group loves Chuck Norris jokes. So we tell a lot of Chuck Norris jokes to keep ourselves light. All right, and then I'm just gonna wrap this up with, obviously we were talking about a lot of logistics here and a lot of planning. Dwight Eisenhower once said in preparing for battle, I have always found that plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. And I can tell you, we have found that to be absolutely true for our group. When you're in the moment and you're taking care of the patients and you're trying to get them cohorted and you're trying to decide what to do with the testing and what to do with the treatment, in the moment, it can be very easy to lose track of the plans, but if you've planned in advance and you've set up the system, it's going to go so much more smoothly and you can really prevent a lot of the negative downstream um, effects like running out of PPE or exposing your staff and getting, getting sick physicians. So we're 
we're finding that planning has been indispensable for our group. Amy, thank you so much for that. That was absolutely wonderful, very informative. I'd like to see if anyone who's um, participating has any questions for you. And again, you can put questions into the chat or feel free to unmute your microphone. So in the spirit of all teach, all learn, um, let's, let's try something here. Um, and also remember right now we don't really have right or wrong answers. Um, Amy mentioned quite a few different strategies in, in her talk. Um, their communication strategies, her planning for surge and consensus, um, some really cool technology solutions, um, supporting wellness, and then also PPE strategies. Um, can anyone share some of the things that you're doing, um, even if it is just confirming what Amy's already mentioned? Um, feel free again to unmute or put anything into the chat if you have other ideas or if you're, you're doing some of the things that she's already mentioned. All right, well, if there are no questions and there's nothing to contribute to that, let's try to go to our case questions because um, I think Rebecca's online and she has um, a few different scenarios. Um, oh, hang on, Rebecca, you did, I think Rebecca posted this to, to um, put, on, put off her case a little bit. So before she goes into her case, she did ask if, she, if um, you can tell us a little bit more about the virtual tools that you're using, Amy. Sure. You want me to talk a little bit more about the virtuals? Yes, please. We just got them today. We're very excited. So we got a virtual stethoscope. Here it is. So the plan would be to put this into a patient's room, call into the patient's room. You just press this button down to turn the virtual stethoscope on. You can instruct the patient where to put the stethoscope and then it transmits the sound wirelessly to your iPhone. And uh, we were experimenting with it earlier today and it was transmitting at least six, eight feet very easily. So we plan to use this to be able to physically examine without necessarily having to go in the room. Thank you. Is anyone else trying anything with different technology solutions? before we turn it over to Rebecca and her case. All right, well, if you do end up doing anything, please share back with our ECHO group. We're trying to collect resources and sharing information out. We're running several um, of these ECHO sessions a week and you know, information is changing constantly. So Rebecca, I'm gonna turn it over to you if you're able to unmute and you can take us through um, each of your cases. Hi, this is Rebecca. Um, let me look at just, I know I have two different scenarios and I'm just trying to see which one I put on here first. Um, okay, so the first one, let me just explain it a little bit here. Um, I'm wondering if there are any, if anybody has dealt with similar situations. Um, I'm looking for, Okay, so I'm just going to read this little scenario for you. A small private clinic that is used as a family practice and urgent care only for a specific employer with approximately 500 employees and their families. There's usually one provider and two staff working on um, any given day, currently doing telehealth visits for acute and chronic illnesses and keeping patients out of the clinic. The employer would like the clinic staff to start taking temperatures at shift changes of all employees before they come into the building to prevent spread of potential illness, specifically the COVID-19. The pro um, they propose having two points of entry to the building with an RN and MA covering each entrance and wearing PPE and checking employees' temperatures as they drive up in their vehicles. The plan is 
to not allow anyone into the building with a fever of 100.4 or more. The clinic staff have very limited PPE and would not be changing PPE in between employees as they would just be continuing to drive through the line. Um, there's also a question as to how this would be documented, if at all, as this would take time and decrease the speed at which all of the employees could be checked prior to getting to start their shift. So I'm wondering, um, do you see this as a potentially helpful or harmful thing for a company to do? And have you seen any similar situations or scenarios with where you guys are working? Thank you for sharing that. Um, does anyone have a question or any questions from Rebecca needing more clarification on the scenario that she's describing? And if not, um, let, let's try to um, go to her question and see if we could generate some recommendations and ideas around this. Um, any of our participants, if not, I'll ask those who are here from Penn State Health on our panel to provide some, some thoughts. Jackie, this is Cynthia Chuang from Penn State. Um, I, I'd be curious what other people have to say. We, we were wondering if this would be a screening modality that we should adopt as well. And so we did a little bit what we could, uh, reviewing whether or not taking somebody's temperature is more sensitive at detecting illness uh, than the CDC recommended questions of shortness of breath cough um, and fever, a subject, you know, reporting a fever. Um, and we didn't, we didn't find anything on that. So we, um, at least in our um, health clinic, have decided to stick with the, the screening questions um, as opposed to actually taking someone's temperature, which, you know, is a little bit cumbersome too, because you need to take the temperature and you need to touch people and then you need to, you know, disinfect the equipment as well. Um, but I'm curious if anyone else is aware of any other literature. We couldn't find any literature that would support taking people's temperature. We understand that in large places like airports, it may be um, quicker when you have mass screening devices, uh, but we didn't, we didn't find uh, evidence to suggest that was better in our situation. That's a great question. Um, Gavin, I think you've joined us. Do you have any thoughts on, on Cynthia's question or, you know, directly to what Rebecca's trying to address? Yes. Hi, everyone. Hi, Jackie. Uh, so everyone on my team uh, is taking their temperature both evening uh, and in the morning. So morning and evening. And that's so we can understand that everyone's normal base temperature is different in the morning and the evening, but also people, st people within my team have different ranges of temperature every day. So that when I start to, to understand over a, a two to three day period of what their normal daily temperature looks like, I can, I can, I can act quicker when I start to see an increase by a few degrees. Uh, again, with all the patients that we are triaging, both the well and the worried well, we're also ensuring that we do take their temperature uh, we do it under the armpit or orally uh, with a thermometer. Uh, again, most people don't know what their normal temperature is, so it's really hard to say when we're looking at temperatures, what activity did you do just before you came in? How are you feeling? And how that may affect their temperature. But I, I really am, I, I'm, with the patients that I've seen, I'm pretty confident there is a low-grade fever very early on at the same time that people may have a scratchy throat and also feeling a little bit fatigued. Fatigue seems to be really kicking in early. That fatigue of, oh gosh, I'm a little, uh, I think we're calling it the, the coronavirus fog at the moment, where people sort of get up and they're in the bed, they feel fatigued, they just don't, don't feel themselves and they're a little bit disorientated. So we're calling it the coronavirus fog. Um, and that seems to be real early symptoms, but I'm seeing a low grade uh, fever with those symptoms as well. Are there any other thoughts on taking um, temperatures? Um, 
prior to employees coming into work. Um, I, I'd like to put this out there. If you have thoughts either way, yes or no, if you would go ahead and put something into the chat, just with a little brief explanation of you know why yes or why no, that might give us a sense of where everyone sits with this. While we're seeing if anyone is, is willing to share their, their opinion on this, um, Gavin, there's a quick question in the chat. What would you consider a low-grade fever over baseline, provided that it's a reasonable, uh, I'm sorry, a reliable baseline is known for an individual? Yes, uh, that, that's a good question, uh, Jackie. And what I'm learning is that um, with everyone in my team, the different ages, males and females, once I get a good idea of where their their baseline is, if I see a one and a half to two degree uh, increase, then I'll ask them, "How are you feeling? What have you been doing? Oh, did you have you, did you work out? Have you been for a run? Have you had a shower?" Just I ask them general questions. How are you feeling right now? Well, I don't have as much strength as I had yesterday. I'm feeling a little run down. I will if I find anyone that has gone up a few degrees um, from their baseline, I'll get them to take their temperature every three hours. Uh, to see whether it falls back down or it's still at that level or it's actually increased. Um, and again, I've got to really uh, highlight that these are small incremental increases. This is not a significant, oh, it's over 100 degrees Fahrenheit or over 38 degrees Celsius type fever. We've, we've actually dropped it back to like um, uh, 37.5 degrees Celsius, um, uh, 99.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, is the area that I'm starting to then, hang on, I don't want you to have direct patient contact or I don't want you to work in this area. How about you go outside and you know, work in the, the triage area, work away from direct contact with people and patients until we under, understand where this, this temperature is going to go back down again and not increase. So that's what we're doing on my team. Uh, thank you for that. So Amy, um, I, it sounds like you're a little concerned about next steps. Um, can you elaborate a little bit? Sure. I think one of the things we have to keep in mind is that it's incredibly easy to overwhelm the system. So one of the things that we have to always be considerate of is if you put us, if you put this in place, what's going to happen next? So if someone has a low grade fever, who are you referring them to? How are they going to get testing? And are we even capable of providing that testing? So one of the things that we've run into on the inpatient side is a lot of people want us to be able to test everyone, but we certainly can't. We don't even have in-house testing available yet. And the Department of Health can get overwhelmed very quickly. So before putting in a policy that says we're gonna take people's temperatures, you really have to think carefully about what are you gonna do if someone has a temperature? Who are you referring them to? And how do we prevent the system from getting overwhelmed in that case? That's a really good point, Amy, and I really appreciate that because, uh, again, if we know they don't need to be hospitalised, if they don't have any sort of uh, uh, symptoms that we're, we're concerned about, well, again, anyone, anyone with a, uh, a cold, a flu, even allergies, until they get diagnosed, again, with COVID-19, will advise, go home, uh, isolate, stay away from other people. We're giving them the same information. If we find they have difficulty breathing, then we've got to consider where we are, that, that they need to be um, maybe admitted to a healthcare facility. But right now, we're, we're trying to get this culture changed where people could actually start taking temperatures on a regular basis. But I've, we've really flipped the paradigm here. Instead of focusing on patient-centered care, we're, we're focusing more, from my perspective, on provider-centered care. I need to maintain the health of my frontline health workers. And that's why my or well, my doctors and my nurses and my other hospital staff are taking their temperature twice a day and then just sending that into human resources. Thank you. So Rebecca, I'm, I'm not sure if this is directly um, answering your questions or helping. Um, so, I mean, it sounds like some of the recommendations are 
a, a middle step before figuring out how to get this information, figuring out what you what would be done with the information. I believe that's what Amy was suggesting. But do you have anything else to add to it before we move on to your second question, or do you have any other follow-up questions for our group? Yes, this is um, a company that is a food service company. So I just wanted people to know that. So they are already using PPE just on the normal regular basis for anybody who's working inside the bakery. So they just want to be extremely careful that they're not sending in, in anyone that could be sick because they do have product that goes out, every, out the door every single day. And within two hours, the product is made and ready to go out the door and then heading to the grocery store. So you are and I are already getting those um, items within probably the 10 to 24 hours of when they're made. So I think they're just trying to come up with ideas in ways that they can try to prevent any of their people from contaminating you know, any type of any, the, the food product. Um, so I think it's a good idea on their behalf, but I did have some of those same questions, like what are you going to do with the information? Um, and I think it would be better rather than just, they were saying using the, the number 100.4, um, but I do think it makes more sense to be monitoring people and using their going off of their own baselines. So that makes a lot more sense to me to really watch it um, per individual, not just one um, specific number. So with that extra information that you've just provided, Gavin, Amy, or anyone else who's on, does that change your responses or give anything else um, you know, for, for Rebecca to be considering? Um, oh, hey, Jackie, this is Gavin. Um, I, I, again, uh, you know, protecting the person and protecting others is our primary role and goal at the moment. Uh, I'm a big supporter of face shields. If you can't get the right mask, um, you know, face shields. We've, we actually have uh, in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area, we have uh, people in the community now that are making nearly 300 face shields a day for us. Um, by following just what, what a normal face shield looks like, getting the plastic, getting some material Velcro and actually making face shields for others that may not need them in the hospitals, we're gonna use them in the hospitals if we require, but also in other areas where one, a face shield stops you from putting your hands on your face. And a face shield also captures any coughs or sneezes or other areas you have against and it hits the face shield. So as long as it comes down around below the chin, around the side there, uh, I'm getting most people to wear face shields now and they can still have that but you know the the verbal the non-verbal communication we can still see who they are um and so that's what we're doing okay thank you so rebecca do you want to go on to your next question your next um scenario sure this is probably a more common one um i'm sure you guys have, are all probably very familiar with this where there's a, a nurse or a staff member at a hospital or clinic who they have no symptoms themselves, but they are taking care of somebody at home, like a child or a family member, who do have symptoms that do have, maybe they've had a fever and the cough for a week or more. Sometimes they have the abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting. And uh, the question is, is whether that nurse should still continue to care for patients if their child could potentially be positive. So their child has not been tested. However, they do have symptoms that could be coronavirus, but they're staying at home. And now what do you do with that staff member, that nurse or that um, provider or whoever's taking care of direct patient care? Do you let them continue to take care of people or do you pull them and have them doing something different? I'm just wondering what you guys are doing with these similar situations. So are there thoughts from um, our participants before we go to the panel? Has anyone run into a situation like this yet? So if this were your employee, would you, what would you recommend? Jack, you want me to answer that one? I'm, anyone is able to, please go ahead. Oh, oh, Amy, would you like to go first? 
<laughs> no, go ahead. I'll, I'll go next. You're, you're so kind. Um, so, so again, we, we're actually creating a dialogue, a communication between our employees, both for how they, you know, how they feel in, on the front line in the hospital itself, but also what's happening at home. We don't often ask our, our, our doctors and our nurses and our hospital staff, what's that, what, what, what are things happening at home? So now we're actually creating a forum like, the, like Amy said, you know, the, the, the team huddles, the team meetings to get that, that conversation going. I've got probably a dozen doctors and nurses at the moment that have someone in their house that either has allergies that hasn't been, or, or has symptoms like allergies, coughs, flu, colds, and we just don't know because there's not enough lab tests. So what we're doing is taking as much precautions as we can. Um, for example, the nurse told me the other day she's now sleeping in the basement and the kids are sleeping upstairs. She has very little contact with them. Someone else in the house is doing all, all the direct contact care with them. But when she comes into the hospital, again, we're going through that process of talking with each other, but ensuring that we can put some sort of protection on them, uh, their face, their eyes, their nose and their mouth in case they do develop symptoms, but also saying, you know, again, here's a few things, monitor your temperature twice a day, tell us if you feel fatigued and we'll reassign you. Um, it's just a matter, Jackie, of, of communicating more and talking more and asking the right two or three questions a day to every employee. Amy, anything to add to that? Yeah, I totally agree. I think one thing to keep in mind is that at least here at Penn State, we've been considering healthcare workers a special population. So for us, special populations have been defined as anyone over the age of 60 who's immunocompromised, who lives in a congregant facility, such as a nursing home or a prison. And healthcare workers are considered a special population. So at the development of any symptoms, a healthcare worker should be tested, at least under our algorithm for what we've been using here. If the healthcare worker is asymptomatic and there's someone at home, then I totally agree. It's really about self-monitoring and making sure that we're checking in with that employee frequently. Thank you. Any other comments or questions or recommendations for Rebecca? She basically had three questions. Um, should the nurse or staff member continue to go to work as usual? Um, should they be tested? And should their loved one who is doing relatively, relatively well at home be tested? Um, so three different questions. I think Amy and, and Gavin have um, given some input on that. But if you have any thoughts on any of those three questions, um, what you would do in those three scenarios, if you would put them into the chat or Go ahead and unmute your microphone and let us know your thoughts on any of those three, just so we can give Rebecca a little bit more to go on here. The one thing I would say from personal experience is the advice that needs to be given is wash your hands. <laughs> I know that sounds really simple, um, I can tell you for me, I am Purelling a million times when I'm at work and then I go home and I forget. It's harder when you're at home because it's not a part of your routine. So one of the things that we've done as a hospitalist group is advise people what to do when they go home and it really needs to include a routine disinfection of doorknobs, light switches, things that are commonly touched, faucets, and you need to start getting in the habit of washing your hands regularly at home, so. Well, thank you for that reminder. And so that's a, good, that's a good point, Jackie, because we're actually using, um, again, you've heard this big call out now for retirees to come out and start volunteering. Uh, we've seen more students get engaged uh, in the front lines and hospital work, but we've actually used a lot of these volunteers now to be the checklist person the per, or the observer, and they're watching people wash their hands and going, you didn't do it long enough, go back and do it again. And so we've put in some, some, uh, some protocols and some procedures and some per people to watch to make sure that things are slowed down uh, generally across the board when we're in a high risk area. But just like Amy said, the common thing is you know, to, to wash your hands, but it, it really helps in a hospital situation when you have someone watching and saying, go back and do it again. 
Thank you for that. Yes, you're right. So, Rebecca, no straight answers, but uh, hopefully a lot of things for you to consider um, in the interest of everyone's time, unless there are other questions or comments. Um, I would like to thank you for joining us. Um, consider submitting questions, cases, examples. Um, we have two sessions coming up on Thursday. The information is up on the screen. Um, and again, if you have any last minute questions, please put them in the chat and we'll make sure to get them addressed in our follow-up email.